Hey, it's Mr. K doing a problem for AP Physics 1. We have the ballistic pendulum problem. Uh, we have this lab in class, so if you uh, were there, or if you missed out, or if you didn't understand, here is the solution to it. Going to look at a bunch of different things here. Um, we've got the spring gun. It's going to have a K constant. It's going to be pulled back a certain distance X. It'll throw this hammer <clears throat> into the mass M1, this ball bearing that we have. M1 is going to fly to the right with some amount of kinetic energy into M2. It's going to get stuck inside of it. Because of the momentum and energy transfer, it's going to swing upwards. And it's going to make some kind of angle theta with the, uh, with the vertical here. And on the ballistic pendulum device itself, we actually have this rod that like gets stuck that tells us exactly what the angle was. Uh, or you can actually take a video of it using huddle technique and see what that angle was in case that rod kind of goes up and swings back. So to start off, I'm going to set this up kind of uh, just with with variables because I know some some of you have trouble with variables and uh, let's see where we can get so to start off here <clears throat> we can talk about the amount of energy that is put into the spring gun there will be a certain problem with that and I'll explain why as we do it but to start off I'm gonna push the spring back it's gonna have some kind of potential energy and um, really we should use U <clears throat> so it'll have some kind of potential energy and it's gonna be due to a spring and we know that's going to be one half k delta x squared. So it has nothing to do with the mass. It just has to do with the strength of the spring and how much you push it back. So assuming that we pull it back to some distance x, we're going to allow it to be released and it's going to impact this m1 ball. The problem with that <clears throat> is that all this energy is actually not going to go into the ball. And if we assume that, then we assume that this thing makes no noise. So to go back and try to find the K value, uh, we do lose a lot of energy with the impact with the ball. So we're actually going to ignore that for now. I just wanted to draw it out and kind of explain why. The whole problem is actually going to start off with this ball after it gets hit by this plunger. And when it gets hit, it's going to have some amount of kinetic energy, Ke. And we know that to be one half mv squared. I'm going to say m1v1. <coughs> Excuse me. So <clears throat> it's also going to have, now that we are in momentum, some amount of momentum here. It's going to call it P1, and that's going to be M1V1 as well. So it's got these two things are very similar, but remember that kinetic energy does not care about direction because of that square value. But if you put in a negative to the velocity, momentum does care about it because a negative will not go away. So we have the ball. It's going to fly into this block over here, and this block is going to swing up. So <clears throat> that block is going to go from here. It's going to swing up. The reason why would be because it would have gained some amount of kinetic energy, and that's going to equal some kind of one-half. Um, I'm going to say M1 plus M2 V both squared. <clears throat> and the reason why I say M1 plus M2 is because this M1 gets stuck inside of the M2 block. It swings up, so we're going to turn that kinetic energy into potential energy again due to gravity, UG. And it's going to be M1 plus M2. <clears throat> Mg would be the force, and H would be the distance. But we do not care about direction there. So we have a direct conversion <clears throat> from kinetic energy to potential energy there. We'll use that in a little bit. <clears throat> Back over here, though. M1 collides with M2. That's going to be a, mo a momentum problem. Anytime you have a collision, think momentum. All right. And so to do the momentum setup here, I'm going to say that the momentum before the collision should equal the momentum after the collision. And if we look, <clears throat> who's moving before the collision? Well, it's going to be M1. That's going to be M1 at some velocity one. And M2 is not moving before the collision, so I'm just going to write the equal sign. Afterwards, <clears throat> we have M1 moving at some velocity V1 prime because we changed it. Somehow it changed velocity, probably slowed down when it hit, when it hit that block. And M2 V2, I'm going to say prime as well because we know the initial velocity of V2 is zero. What's unique about this <clears throat> is that V1 prime and actually not plus, but equals V2 prime. Okay, and that should make sense because one's stuck inside the other one. So these two things are the same. If they're the same, that means we can do some factoring <clears throat> and say that M1 plus M2 times V of both. That's where we get the velocity of both there. 
So <clears throat> kind of looking at this problem, here's what we got. We have kinetic energy initially, because this thing is slammed into the ball, it's going to be, ma be making a move. It's got initial momentum as well. We've got <clears throat> this momentum equation for collision, because this block got struck by the ball and the ball stuck into it. Here's that setup here. Afterwards, it's going to swing up. We're no longer going to use momentum because we don't care about direction anymore. And just another kinetic energy to potential energy conversion. Okay. In class, we would have been able to measure the mass of the ball. So I'll say, yep, we can measure that. We would have been able to measure the mass of the block. And, well, <clears throat> we would have been able to measure the angle as well as the length of string which I did not write down here just yet, but all those things we can actually measure in class. We would not be able to measure <coughs> h, we would assume g. Uh, we wouldn't know the velocities of both, mm, and the velocity of yeah, v1 and v2, we would not know the velocity. The goal, I think, would be to get back to this velocity v1. So, my goal is to find out the muzzle velocity of the bullet after it comes out of the gun. So, looking at all this stuff, <coughs> here's kind of how you need to set up. If I want to find V1, that means that I would have either had to have the kinetic energy or the momentum of it, but I don't. So I need to go over here and say, all right, if I want to find V1, I got to know V1 prime, the velocity of it afterwards, and V2 prime. Well, that's just velocity of both, the velocity of this block. Well, we don't know that either, but we do know the masses, so that's good. So if we found the velocity of both, then we can go back and find the velocity of the one. Well... <clears throat> We kind of need to look over here then. There's the velocity of both, and I know the masses of both, and that's going to equal this potential energy here at the end. If only I knew h, then I can go back and it's, it's a long chain of finding h, finding velocity of both, using velocity of both, and then going back and finding velocity of the one. So <clears throat> ideally, if we want to find v1, I got to find h. And the way we do that is we look at what this height is. You see how this thing raised up in height vertically? It's about that far in the paper. Well, <clears throat> the way we do that is we look at the string. And so we consider, and there's a problem that we did earlier that kind of looks like this, where we had something, let's say that's about four centimeters on my ruler. And if we swing up, <clears throat> that string shouldn't change length. And so this is L and this is L and I really, really, really want to find this little piece here. <clears throat> and that would be H. And so if I look, the angle that I have in this problem is right there. I want H. So what I want to do is I want to find this side of the triangle. <clears throat> and so really I'm going to do L minus this big side minus this small side. And that's going to require cosine of theta. And that'll be H. <clears throat> so if I find H, then I can go backwards and find everything. So really, I've already solved it for you. But let's go ahead and do a, um, a number solve. And so this would be the, uh, the second part of the video where you would actually plug stuff in. So let's say that this mass M1 was 0 0.05 <clears throat> kilograms. Okay, so was that like 50 grams? M2, let's just make it like... Mm, 0 0.4 kilograms angle theta let's make that about 30 degrees just because <clears throat> and I think that's all we, no, well, we need the length over here let's make this length about um, 0 0.2 meters okay <coughs> so if we want to go back and find this velocity at v1 then I'm gonna start at the very end and work my way backwards okay so all we need to do here is say L and switch over to switch over to purple to solve this thing. L is 0 0.2 minus L again, 0 0.2. Cosine of theta. Theta would be 30 degrees, by the way. If you don't want to hear all this, you are free to skip to the end. I will not be offended because I won't even know. 0 0.2 minus 0 0.2 cosine of 30 is going to be <clears throat> 0. 0268. 0268. And we'll uh, be a little, a little liberal with the rounding here. Um, and that's going to be meters. <clears throat> and so that's going to be the height. 
and we're going to utilize that height right here. The height right here, so we're going to set these two things equal. So we have kinetic energy, one half m of one plus m of two, <coughs> v of both squared is equal to the m one plus m two g h. And if you look, yep, we are canceling out m one and m two. <coughs> so I've got v of both squared divided by two is equal to g h. G h is what I just got. G is going to or h is what I just got. G is going to be ten. Let's move that two over. So something that happens quite often is square root two g h for v both. You're going to start to notice that a lot more and more as you do these problems. <clears throat> so two times ten, and then that h value that we just got two six eight. <clears throat> And that's going to be square root of uh, 20 times the answer that I just got. So let's do that. 0 0.732. 0 0.732. Double check your concept real fast. Is this an acceptable velo little velocity? Uh, yeah, it's pretty slow. So um, I, I would expect it to be pretty slow, hopefully, if we have something that is um, pretty small hitting something pretty big. So <clears throat> we're going to go back and we're going to use that right over here. Because, again, we need to find this M1V1 here. And so we just plug in. And it's just, it's, it's just a plug-in battle. So, again, just just math. Skip around if you want. Uh, here, the, the M's don't cancel out. Uh, so 0 0.05 is good. And an M2 would be 0 0.4. V both, 0 0.732 as we just got. And then uh, let's go ahead and say this is V1. And we'll uh, move that M1 on the bottom already, because we're going to have to divide out anyways. <clears throat> so M1's going to be 0 0.05, and uh, that's that's the last step. So, let's see what we get. Uh, 0 0.05 plus 0 0.4. Actually, let's do the quantity of that. Quantity 0 0.05 plus 0 0.4 times... Well, that's my answer? I think it was. Divided by 0 0.05 gives me 6.59 and uh, V1 equals 6.59 meters per second. Is this good? Let me double check because I don't know if I plugged in that right value. 0.05 plus 0.4 times 0.732 over 0.05. Looks like it's going to be, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me for the cough. Um, here's what we got. We've got this velocity at the end. And, um, well, really, this is the velocity of the beginning of this ball after it gets shot up by this gun. This is the velocity of both after they collide. Notice that there's a huge change in that velocity. So, you know, if you get, you watch a movie and some guy gets shot by, by a shotgun and uh, all those pellets fly into him and he goes flying back 30 feet, uh, that's, that's not realistic. You get shot by something small and you're really big, you're probably not going to move that much. It'll hurt like hell, but uh, uh, you're not going to go flying backwards. So, <clears throat> let's just double check one more thing. Let's look at the loss of kinetic energy in this problem, see if it is an elastic or inelastic problem. And the way we're going to do that is just to look at the one half mv squared of the things in the beginning compared to the things at the end. So in the beginning, I've got my kinetic energy initially, and all that energy belongs to this ball bearing this movement. So this thing is flying across one half, uh, what was it, 0.05? We're going to take this velocity, 6.59. We're going to square that guy. So let's take this number, <clears throat> square it, and then uh, multiply by 0 0.05. Divide that thing by 2. And we got uh, not, not that much at all. 1.08 joules. But it is quite a bit for this little ball bearing. Um, let's go check over here. We got the velocity of both. So the kinetic energy at the end after the collision <clears throat> would be 1 half the mass of both. So the 0 0.05 plus the 0 0.4. And then we'll take that 0 0.732 and we'll square that sucker. So point, well, 0 0.5 for the half times quantity 0 0.05 plus 0 0.4 times 0 0.732, square them. <coughs> and I end up with the kinetic energy of 0 0.125. Um, Oh, five, six, we'll just keep all of it. <clears throat> so, what happened? 
What happened to this stuff? What's my difference? Minus 0.08. Uh, take it over the original 1.08. We lose like 88%, 88.8% energy loss, so 88.8% loss, E-loss. Um, where to go? You know, that's one, that's one thing that we need to start talking about is um, this energy, this makes it an inelastic collision, by the way, uh, if you have energy loss. This energy loss goes to heat and sound, and you, you know, you would have shot this bullet into this block, you would have heard it. Um, you would have deformed this this rubber stuff inside of here, so it keeps it in there, and that's going to um, cause some heat heat generation as well. Well, that has to come from somewhere, and that's going to be the kinetic energy of the, that bullet. So we have a huge amount of loss, and that usually occurs whenever you have a big difference in masses and and momentum changes or impulses that occur. Um, not too sure what the impulse would be. Uh, well, I, I do know the change in velocity for this ball, but I'm not too sure what the impulse would be here necessarily. Uh, that would be another another project, another day to really take a look at that. Uh, but remember that impulse is a uh, it's just a change in momentum, and usually it's due to a force up for a time, or you just look, you just look at what the change in velocity is. All right, that'll finish up this video. Hopefully, you were able to skip around to the parts that you needed, and uh, that you know this lab didn't give you too much trouble. All right, have a good one.